time, let me start with uh, Ms. Jacoby. And I'd really like to draw your attention to your figure four in your testimony, which shows the offshoring of corporate profits to tax havens. And what's notable about it is that it starts at zero in 1975. This really wasn't going on. And it grew steadily to 2010 when 20% of multinational corporate profits had shifted to tax havens. And then from 2010 to 2015, there was a dramatic jump from 20% to 35%, and it's now climbing towards 40%. Um, when you look at that and you compare where the benefit goes, um, how does it stack up for a small business that does not have the wherewithal to establish an offshore profit-hiding tax haven compared to its, say, chain competitor uh, down the street that does have that capability. Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, yeah, so the, the 2017 law, uh, it, it, it dramatically changed the way that uh, foreign profits are taxed. Um, of, of multinationals, and um, so what, what happens now is um, large corporations who uh, have um, big, for, big foreign profit centers, lots of foreign profits um, overseas, they, they pay a lower tax rate on those foreign profits than they do on their domestic profits or, or purely domestic businesses pay. So there is, there, there, uh, the, the law preserved a, a, a good tax deal that multinationals have on their foreign profits. It's basically a big business tax shelter that small business doesn't have access to. Domestic businesses, small businesses, generally they don't have foreign yeah. profits and can't, can't use them. Um, Mr. Bartlett, you make a couple of statements that I'd like to uh, raise in your um, testimony. One, you cite um, a prominent uh, colleague um, who said, quote, there's no evidence whatsoever that the Bush tax cuts actually diminished revenue. They increased revenue because of the vibrancy of these tax cuts in the economy. You point out this was not true. You then uh, quote Treasury Secretary Mnuchin um, saying that the tax cut would be offset by economic growth and that there would be no increase in the budget deficit. And you pointed out that that earned uh, four Pinocchios for being so disingenuous. And then you say, perhaps the most fantastic claim made for the Trump tax cut by Kevin Hassett of the Council of Economic Advisors is that it would cause so much additional corporate investment that workers would see a rise in their real wages of between $3,000 and $7,000. Um, what is going on with these various statements if they're not supported by the evidence? Well, uh, keep in mind that these statements were made mostly in 2017 before the <coughs> legislation was enacted. And one of the things I tried to do in my prepared testimony is look at what has actually happened in the seven years since then. And very few studies, I know uh, some of the, test, uh, the footnotes in uh, my colleague's testimony are, are, to pr are projections based on uh, studies that were done in 27, 20, 2017, 2018. I tried to find things that were uh, written more recently, uh, uh, perhaps, uh, uh, or, or preferably, I should say, in the, the academic literature, which I, th which I think is more substantive and more dependable. And I looked at peer-reviewed journals, and, and the, the, the data that I could find showed no macroeconomic impact whatsoever. It didn't raise growth. It didn't lower growth. Uh, and I think I conclude but from that. But it did shift. I would just say. It did I, shift I, wealth, correct? Excuse me? It did shift wealth. Oh, absolutely. No question about that. Um, uh, but I'm more interested in the macroeconomic effect on uh, investment and growth and uh, employment. And I would just f close by saying that if a tax cut had no positive impact, then it can't have any negative impact if undo. you get rid of it. Yeah, understood. Now, you may not want to for other reasons, but I don't but think it would impact the economy. Let me turn to Mr. Kogan before I uh, lose my time. Um, the equation here has been spending versus revenue. Um, and uh, Dr. Michelle said this is basically a proxy fight over the size of government. 
Um, it looks to me from your testimony that there are other factors in here. One is demographics, that the American population is aging, and that causes effects both in revenue and in costs that should be fairly accounted for. And within that, um, I've long believed that health care cost is a particular problem, um, and we'll be doing, I promise you, uh, Ranking Member Grassley hearings in the future on ways to save health care costs that don't require uh, benefit cuts, but take advantage of things like accountable care organization savings. And uh, my graph that I use all the time that shows that like trillions of dollars below anticipation. Could you comment on how spending versus revenue intersect with demographics and external factors like health care cost? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, right, so um, our demographic changes in rising health care costs are the reason that spending is increasing. If you break spending into two categories, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, everything else, including the everything else entitlements, the everything else is shrinking as a percent of GDP, uh, and it's the Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security that are growing. And they are growing not because they are getting more, they're doing more. It's not because we're giving more and more to, to seniors uh, and, to, and, to, uh, and to extremely poor people, but because it costs more to do the same. That is the rising, that is the demographics that's changing the ratio of non-workers to workers, and it is also the rising healthcare costs. And so what this means is that if you want to spend less, you are necessarily saying that future seniors should be getting less of a benefit than they're currently getting. That's the only way to do it. Since that's the portion of the budget that's growing, if you want to cut that, you have to say that the current amount that we're doing for Social Security recipients, the current amount that we're doing for seniors, the current amount that we're doing for people on Medicaid is too much, and future people should be having less. That's the only way to do it. Um, and you know, and the, the, the very nice thing that I had, though, is in my testimony, we used to have a tax system that, despite that rising, we keep up with that, and now we don't. Sure. To your point about health care, it has been going down a lot. It's still going up, but things like the Affordable Care Act and things like drug price negotiation have been push, have been bending that curve, um, and, it, and it would be a great source of, of to bend more. Great. Well, just for fun, as I turn to uh, Chairman Grassley, I'm going to put into the record my graph that I use all the time that shows the change in health care cost, but we're still way above all of our uh, international economic competitors. Sir. 